In times like these. In times like these. In times like these. There's certain stories that everybody needs to hear. I know what it's like to be the only black person at the table. What was that like for you? Stories that illuminate the human condition. Are you, in the end, optimistic about our country now and its future? Stories that connect and unite us. And with all this devastation, they are in dire need. Restaurants are giving free meals to both victims and first responders. The Red Cross and other organizations are on the ground. As journalists, it's our responsibility and it's our privilege to tell these stories and tell them truthfully, communicating clearly, and in a way that brings meaning to our readers and viewers. It is without question the darkest day in America's history, September 11, 2001. Two massive explosions were detonated. To ask the tough questions in these toughest of times. You've become a hero for so many women who have been sexually harassed in the workplace. And I can see you getting emotional right now. Mm -hmm. Because I never thought I was going to be in this position. Grady has given me the tools to be the best that I can be. To cover every story fairly, accurately, and to fight for the truth. Preparation for the work that I'm doing. The courage and the confidence to be the best journalist I could possibly be. The skills that I learned at the Grady School have truly served me every step of my career, starting with those first city council meetings I covered in Athens to the big stories I get to cover on the national stage. The tools that Grady gave me have stood the test of time and continue to. They're truth tellers, storytellers, and trailblazers. They are our Grady Greats. Live from ABC's The View Studios in New York, welcome the Grady Greats. ABC News Correspondent, Will Carr. Senior Vice President and General Manager of Media for the New York Times, Lisa Ryan Howard. Anchor of Inside Edition, Deborah Norville. ABC News Correspondent, Deborah Roberts. And your Grady Greats moderator, the groundbreaking, barrier-breaking, award-winning journalist, author, and Peabody Board of Jurors Emeritus, Charlene Hunter-Galt. Are we ready? Wow. I think so. Well, I got the go sign. Welcome to Grady Greats, a conversation about our enduring values and the power of journalism. Hello to all at my alma mater, they're all watching in Athens. Yay. Hey, y'all in Athens. Go dogs. And here in New York City, it is my pleasure to be joined on stage by this exceptional panel of journalists, fellow alum, and now my role models. <laughs> Thank you all for being here. Such a pleasure. But before we get started, I have to do a personal thing which I hope you will join me in. I want to give a shout out to Georgia Dog, the great Sony Michelle, who just <laughs> led the Patriots to the Super Bowl game. Go, Sony! <laughs> I'm sorry, I just had to do that, because I stayed right by my television set watching that game. Did you go woof, woof, woof when he went across? I almost had a heart attack. <laughs> but anyway. All right, our fellow Grady Great, ABC's anchor, news anchor, Amy Robach, was called away on assignment. We like that. Mm -hmm. We miss her, but we like yes. that. But she wanted to share this message with each of you. Hello to my fellow Grady Greats and to the students and faculty at Grady and everyone in New York and Athens GA who are watching. I'm so sorry I couldn't be there with all of you. I've been called away on assignment, which is par for the course. It's exciting, but sometimes very inconvenient to jump on planes with little notice to cover stories. And I am on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and that is the nature of our business. But saying yes to breaking news, assignments and opportunities, well, that's how I got to where I am today. 
and that's why I'm not with you all today. I love this job despite all the demands, and it is an honor and a privilege to tell other people's stories with empathy, compassion, and integrity. All skills I learned at Grady and skills I use each and every day here at ABC News. Opening people's minds and their hearts through storytelling is my passion. And if that sounds like what you want to do for a living, then journalism is the career for you. Thank you so much for including me in this incredible group of journalists, these Grady greats. And as always, please let next season be our year. Go dogs! <laughs> Well, we wish her all the best on her assignment. I know she'll be terrific. Now, like Amy, we all know firsthand the demands of our career. So my first question to each of you is, what was it that made you want to become a journalist? Mm. Um, start with you. Can I start? Um, and can I just start with a personal note? Because especially coming uh, the day after Martin Luther King Day, um, I just want to offer you I thank you, at the risk of getting emotional here. Here, here. But I am sitting here on this stage, and I am a journalist because I'm standing on your shoulders. Oh, thank you. You walked through those doors at the University of Georgia and allowed me to be able to walk through those doors. And I don't think it's an understatement to say that that opened up the reality. I mean, I used to watch the evening news. I watched Walter Cronkite say, and that's the way it is every I'm not night. that old. No, 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 no. <laughs> You're not that old. But I watched that every night, and I watched the changing face of uh, the evening news. I saw Michelle Clark, a black woman who mm. was reporting, Lim Tucker, a black mm. man, Connie Chung, an Asian woman. Mm -hmm. And when I began to see these reporters from different ethnicities reporting, uh, and I didn't even, I wasn't even aware, I don't think, of what had happened at the University of Georgia at that time. I began to feel that it was possible. Mm. I thought, that is something I want to do. From my small den in Perry, Georgia, I saw this as a possibility and knew that I wanted to get out there in the world and, and, and somehow tell stories or witness stories. And were you encouraged? I was encouraged. Bye. Absolutely. Well, I was just in sort of encouraged by the changes. I mean, it was the 1970s, and it felt like everything was changing and everything was possible. And I thought, wow, I want to go out there and I want to do something sort of different. I want to tell stories. I want to meet people who are in some of these places that I'd never heard of before. Well, we're so glad you did decide that. Well, so am I. So that was sort of my moment. Deborah, yours? You know, it's funny. Um, no one encouraged me. Absolutely no one. When I was a senior in high school, I said, you know what? I think I want to be a television reporter. And, and what got me interested, I saw the production. I saw what you guys behind the cameras were doing. I thought, God, this just looks like so much fun. But I really loved research. I thought I wanted to be a lawyer. And I thought production, research, oh, you'd be a TV reporter. So I put my sights on the University of Georgia. I aspired to become a television journalist. No one said, hey, Deb, I think you can do that. Mm -hmm. um, I was, I was too blonde, I was too pretty. Um, <laughs> being smart didn't matter. You know, it was just like, no one said, yes, you can achieve this dream. So I think there are a lot of kids who are watching this um, feed right now who are thinking, oh my God, the deck is so stacked against me. No, it isn't. Not if you have the unlimited capacity for hard work. Not if you are that person who is insanely curious about everything and, and just want to find out things. And then, because Deb and I are from Georgia and, you know, we, I'm just smart, you know, because I get paid to talk, um, but I talk for free. Um, we like to tell stories. I like to find out things and share them with other people. So the fact that there was a profession where you could do that, where it was held in such high regard that it was the first thing they added to the Constitution, um, I was all in. But no one said, yeah, you can do this. And the first internship I applied for, they said, come back when you're a year older. Channel 2 in Atlanta turned me down. They said, come back when you're a junior. Come back when you're one year older, because I tested out of my freshman year. So with my tail between my legs, I went over to public TV. <laughs> Got an internship there. The last day of the legislative session, we were covering the Georgia General Assembly. And the last day of the internship, the guy's wife, who was running Channel 5, the competition for Channel 2, saw me, saw some potential, and I got a gopher job there that summer. I was on the air the third day of my internship working against Channel 2. So folks, if they tell you you can't do it, they're mistaken. <laughs> That's a great story. By the way, I have to tell you, 
I have to insert, I was doing a satellite interview a couple of weeks ago and somebody said, Deborah Norville is here right oh. now. And I said, wrong Deborah. <laughs> wrong Deborah. Same school, but Same wrong school. Deborah. And actually, um, Deb was my little sister's dorm mate in Myers <laughs> Dormitory at Georgia. So, oh, that I mean, was I, my dorm. Oh, Center, okay. I was in yeah. Center Myers. All right. Well, oh. she, so I've known her literally longer than anybody in this city, I think, right? It's been yeah. a while. It's been yes. a while. Great. Exactly. Now, Lisa, you're in a different category than the working journalist, but you're still in journalism, mm -hmm. in advertising. What, right. what caused you to get there, go there? So I like to think I'm enabling the journalists, the hard work that you guys are doing. Yes. <laughs> well, tell, tell, tell people what you do. I will, I will. And I'm married to a journalist, so I feel like I do live it. Um, so I work at the New York Times. I, uh, My run, alma mater. Uh, yes, that's right, that's right. Um, so I run operations, planning, and sales for the entire business side of the New York Times. So what I'm doing is trying to make money to hire journalists, to support the ambitious journalists that we want to do at the New York Times. Um, it is very expensive to produce deeply reported, on the ground, original news stories. And I think it's probably more threatened than ever. Mm. Um, and so we have really doubled down our efforts, particularly in the last couple of years, around putting more journalists on the ground across the country and across the world um, in order to be able to tell the stories that are original and that are speaking truth to power. And so I have never felt prouder in my career than what I do today mm -hmm. for you. You know, the thing is, here's the thing. We fight over the New York Times. It gets delivered to the house. So I've become a reader on my computer, mm -hmm. so I don't have to fight with my husband. Uh -huh. <laughs> he gets the paper. Huh? He gets the paper he first the and then he reads the digital. He goes off in his side, and I keep mine in the bed. And I do not get out of bed until I've read the whole paper. Mm -hmm. Wow. Nice. Dedication. I'm not going to tell you what that results in. But anyway. <laughs> now, Will, you and I have um, a mutual, wonderful friend. We do. Tom Johnson, who was editor of the Red and Black when I was first at UGA. And then I went to CNN when he was head of right. CNN. So we go way back in a certain kind of way. I wouldn't I mean, be here without Tom, without yeah. a doubt. And he, UGA grad uh, and one of the most important mentors in my career, for sure. So that just shows how you keep paying it forward to other uh, University of Georgia graduates. Um, being from LA, I'd be remiss if I didn't say that we had to give a shout out to Todd Gurley as well. <laughs> <laughs> just thinking about that, you know, Cody and Todd. I'd also personally like to thank uh, Dean Davis and Parker and especially Robin, who has done a phenomenal job. Yes. Um, but let's go back to the first together. question that I got from my other colleagues here. What caused you to want to be a journalist? <laughs> so I have a bit of an anecdote for you guys. It was my freshman year. I had walked on uh, to play football at Georgia. And wow. uh, I was really more of a tackling dummy than anything else. <laughs> so you like Sony Michelle, too. <laughs> <laughs> Although you didn't make was it a little better, <laughs> A little better than I was. Uh, when I realized that I wasn't going to go to the NFL, I decided that I wanted to go into sports broadcasting. So I got into the journalism school, got into News Source. Uh, and I convinced uh, the professors at the time, Ma Michael Kassinger and Steve Smith, that I just wanted to do sports. So the first day, they were going to let me do sports. Somebody called out sick or was hungover, so they said, you have to go do a news story. <laughs> There's a story about um, a college student who overdosed on heroin, and he was in a neighborhood that was zoned for single-family housing, which meant you couldn't have fraternities in this, uh, in this neighborhood because it was one of the nicer neighborhoods in Athens. <laughs> and so we want to know if the city knew that they were operating a fraternity house in this neighborhood. So what we want you to do is go get the zoning director on camera. So I don't even know what a zoning director is at the time. Uh, I was probably only thinking about the keg party or the girl I was trying to take on a date. <laughs> um, so we called and they didn't call us back and I went to the professors and I said, uh, we can't do the story, they won't call me back. And so Kasten Garris said, oh no, go down to the zoning department <laughs> and sit outside his door until you get him on camera. So we go do that, we sat there for an hour or two. And finally the zoning director comes out and he was under uh, the thought that we were actually real journalists. And so <laughs> he, tur he, turned to, he turned to the photographer and said, you cannot come in. But he pointed to me and said, you can come in. So they had given me a list of questions to ask. So we went in and we sat down and on his desk, he had three note cards on the desk. And so I went into my first question that Cassingera had given me and I said, you know, how often do you guys actually enforce this ordinance? 
and he looked down on the first note card and he read a response that had nothing to do with what I asked him. And so I didn't really know exactly what was happening, but <laughs> my sister's here. My father is an attorney and I clerked for him growing up. Uh, I was in a lot of courtrooms. And so you kind of get the, the BS sensor going off. So I asked him the second question. He looked down at the second note card and it had nothing to do with what, what that question had uh, that we were talking about either. So at some point, I think I said something to the effect of, are, are you going to keep reading those note cards or can you like give me some information? So he got up, he grabbed me by the shoulder and he pushed me out of the door and he said, this interview is over. So we had a photographer there at the time who I can't remember exactly who it was, but we went back and Ben Mayer, who's sitting right there, who's a great producer for MSNBC was there. And I went back and told the producer, uh, the professors what happened. And I said, well, again, we don't have a story. And they go, no, we have a great story. <laughs> <laughs> so we aired it, and the local paper ended up picking up a story on the zoning director. They did a bit of an expose, and he got a lot of hot water. And at that point, for me, sports became more entertainment, sure. and journalism became my passion. Mm. And knowing that there are people in uh, positions of power who should probably not necessarily be there, uh, or who need to be held accountable uh, really uh, became injected into my DNA. Wow. That's a great, great story. story. That's a great, story. Yeah. great story. Wonder what was on note card number three. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't get that far, but I don't think it was go dogs. <laughs> All right. Now, I had a professor when I was at UGA, I think it was my first year, which was January 1961. Oops, that's how old I am. Mm -hmm. um, but he used to quote Hegel. He never said he was quoting Hegel. He used to just take it as his own. We learn from history right. that we do not learn from history. Mm. So my question to you and any one of you who wants to take it can start. Did you learn anything from history? And can you give me an example that helped you in your career? Oh, gosh. Wow. I just I'll heard go. yours. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know that question that everybody always asks, kind of a cliche question, if you could have dinner with uh, somebody, who would it be? My, well, I'd, I would have two. One would be Peter Jennings, because I grew up watching ABC, and I thought that he was just an absolute legend. But the second, for me, would be Winston Churchill, because to me, Churchill was the perfect, imperfect person in the moment during World War II, holding on until America got in the war. And mm -hmm. if you know that much about Churchill, you know he was kind of a pain in the butt, <laughs> uh, especially when he was uh, imbibing in uh, some scotch. So, <laughs> um, but he always believed in himself when so many people within his own country did not believe in him. And he believed that he knew the right path for the country and he fought and he fought and ultimately, uh, you know, without Churchill uh, around in 1940, the world could look a lot different. So I've always taken away, uh, if you believe in yourself and you believe in what you're doing, don't let the outside noise influence you at all. Go with your gut and stick with that. So, so that means, though, because you're not old enough to have been around during World War II. I got some II. gray hair. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but you've studied history, it sounds have, like to absolutely. me. Absolutely. What about the rest of you? Have you learned I think anything it's a specific? I think as a journalist, it's. In a lot of respects, it's so much easier now because you've got your phone, you've got Google, the facts are right there. I think when Deb and I were coming along, you had to know this stuff. Mm -hmm. You had to know that you know consumer spending was two thirds of GDP. You had to know um, what the the MARTA budget had been for the last three years and how much overrun there had been. Oh, you, you had just, to look it up. But you had to remember it because yeah. you couldn't like look it up right there on the fly. You had to know this stuff and study it. But I think as journalists, we also have to to make our own history. I think. We become better journalists the more history we have as journalists. Mm -hmm. You know, you learn so much. That first story when that guy was trying to spin you at the zoning department that the next official you went into interview, you were ready. And you were a better reporter as a result of that. So I think our history, our individual histories as reporters make us better journalists. But if we haven't studied the world around us, because our job as journalists is to report on the world, whatever section of the world we're assigned to cover, if we don't have a deep knowledge about this, then we will be f flawed as reporters. Deborah, what about you? I mean, I, I mean, clearly, I appreciate you saying that you help make history. But you need a perspective, do you not? I mean, was there anything in history that helped you in your career? Well, I would say um, not necessarily a particular part of history. I mean, obviously, the civil rights struggle had a lot to do with it because I did sort of watch that unfold as so many people did on television. Mm -hmm. And so that spurred me on in my career, I think, to be interested in seeing change happen, but also particularly as a child of the South, 
seeing that kind of change happen, knowing that people had had their voting rights suppressed and things like that. But I think more than anything else, too, just the curiosity about history. I mean, one of my early jobs in uh, Orlando at uh, a station that I worked for, I covered the space shuttle. And I didn't really know the history that well of NASA, but I learned mm -hmm. very quickly because I wanted to be a part of that, that story. So I think having that curiosity that even if you don't really know it, that you are curious about it and you want to dig into it mm -hmm. to try to find out a little more. Because I, I keep hearing people say, I'll get to you in a second, but I keep hearing people say about our current political turmoil, these are the worst of times. But if you know history, you oh, know no, we've been not. through some other yeah, bad times and sure. that turned out pretty good, yeah, thanks in part to journalists who covered the story. You were about to say. I was gonna, just going to say from a little bit of a different perspective, at the New York Times, um, there are two projects that we have that are, I think, uh, really helping to bring to light the importance of history and a lot of what's happening today. Um, one of them is called Overlooked. I don't know if any of you have seen mm -hmm. this content. That's yes. wonderful. Oh, I love it. Mm -hmm. I read I it every that. day on my yeah. computer. So our gender editor, I think it's that we hired the very first on your computer. It's okay to read on your computer. We like that as long as people are paying for their subscription. Yes. Right. Good. Um, but the Overlooked series was started by Jessica Bennett, who we, we believe is the industry's very first gender editor. Mm -hmm. Not only writing stories, but also holding the, the um, newsroom to account in terms of photos that were that making sure that the photos are representative mm -hmm. of a very d diverse population that we live in, making sure that bylines are representative of a diverse population, making sure that sources and stories um, are, are... So she has a, a big job in the organization, but she's launched a couple of series, one of them overlooked, which is basically rewriting history. It's saying, we as the New York Times wrote about old white men in our obituary section for the last 150 years. But there were a lot of people of color, um, women, uh, people who didn't get the spotlight and who should have. Um, you know, I, uh, Emily Roebling, who really was responsible for building the Brooklyn Bridge, you know, never had a, um, never had an obituary. So mm -hmm. she, we're rewriting history in the form of these obituaries and actually the History Channel has, um, has bought the rights to it because they want to bring it in to wow. being it as a television show. And then the second thing I was going to say that we're really trying to do because history is a very important part of pe helping people understand the world today. Mm -hmm. And that's our mission at the Times is to help people understand the world. And so we partnered with Google and this is where the business side does kind of come in and, as I said, help enable the journalism. We partnered with Google. We could not afford to, if you can believe this, um, there is a basement in the, at the New York Times. We call it the morgue. Mm. And it is where all of these very rich his, historic moments are are chronicled and kept in a, in a library of sorts. And there is one guy, he's really interesting, um, who manages it all. But if we, if our building caught on fire, that history would be Ooh, gone. Wow. Mm. And we never were able, nor did we have the funds to digitize it. And so Google, in partnership with us, is digitizing all of those archives. And you're seeing, if you read the New York Times, um, whether it be digital or in print, or even in audio, we're bringing a lot of those stories back to life in the pages of the New York Times because those stories are so resonant with what's happening today. I, I won't go into details now, but you had one in that category about the first African Americans in the social pages or something like that. Mm -hmm. Shirley Chisholm's executive assistant had a niece who was about to get married. And this had to be when I was there in the late 70s, mm -hmm. in the 70s. And he brought me the uh, picture of her African-American, mm -hmm. so I took it. And I must say, I had a little bit of an attitude because mm -hmm. I was thinking they were going to turn me down. Mm -hmm. And I said, I've got a, an announcement I'd like you to put in the paper. And I handed him, and he looked at it. He said, OK. <laughs> and that was the first African-American uh, engagement announcement wow. ever in the time. And I wanted to tell the person who wrote that story, wait a minute, I had the first one. Uh -huh. But, you know, I'm so modest. I, no, I, you should. I, I have to. a, let's talk from a business development perspective because we're still surfacing a lot of these well, stories. I'll and find it. Would be it. Great I to tried have you. to find it, and that was part of the reason. I, anyway, that's another story. Yeah. But I love that you were ready to fight. 
you were ready to like to have your details there. Oh and, yeah, and it turned out not to be as hard. Yeah, you, have, as you, you have to be like that sometimes. You have mm -hmm. to push. Yes, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. you have to push students. You have to push <laughs> sometimes. Now you mentioned something interesting about digitizing the uh, stuff in the morgue, the things in the morgue. How much has journalism changed over the years? Because sometimes when I see the demands on these younger journalists, I'm thinking, oh my goodness, I'm glad I'm past all that. Mm -hmm. How much has it changed? <laughs> we all turn well, and look at you, Will, yeah. the youngest yeah. on the panel. I mean, don't you have to do digital and, and take we film? Do. Social take media. Like when you um, cover a story, how many different animals do you have to feed? A lot. Uh, GMA, we have multiple digital obligations. You have world news and then, you know, whatever's going on on the website. You know, it's an interesting question because I remember uh, people when I was in college in News Source saying, you know, traditional broadcast news will be dead 10 years from now. And obviously it's still going. Um, in fact, I was sitting with David Muir yesterday and uh, talking with him and apparently world news has its uh, highest ratings right now uh, higher than World News had 13 years ago. So wow. people are still tuning in and watching traditional news broadcast. But at the same time, they're getting their news uh, all over the place. I have three younger sisters. Uh, Sarah's pretty good at actually watching newscasts. The other two absorb all their news from Instagram and Snapchat. Mm -hmm. And when you're talking about news, you're talking like 30 second snippets at that. I mean, 30 seconds might be long. They may be getting like 10 second snippets. Well, I want to ask news. her when this is over, <laughs> are you learning anything? She's but not never shy. mind, not now, not now. <laughs> um, so Th that's a it's little a troublesome it's for a balancing me. act because you do your stories for Good Morning America, you do your stories for World News, you do longer form pieces written for abcnews.com, but mm -hmm. you also realize that some people are only going to pay attention to a 10 or 15 second clip that you're posting on social media. Mm, that and makes so, your responsibility much greater. Especially on complicated, intricate stories exactly. where you have to peel back the layers. Yeah. These days, especially with millennials, a lot of my friends, you have to figure out how you can do that in a very charismatic way to keep them engaged. Because if you start getting boring, they're just going on to the next thing immediately. Right. Now, and you know, Twitter and Instagram, too, so you've got that to feed as well. Yeah, I was taking some lessons downstairs a little <laughs> while ago on how to post some pictures. Look, I want to go to another question, though, because, and you, and you can add All right. to the, your answer to this question. But, you know, I mentioned a few moments ago that these are difficult, challenging times. And journalists have been called in some quarters as enemies of the people. Mm. And there's a term that I say I'm going to stop using because I think it helps perpetuate it, but for purposes of this conversation, I'm going to use it now. So the term fake news, Ugh. I hate it. I hate it. And it has spread all over the world, yes. including to despots yes. who are challenging our colleagues and their reporting. So how is that affecting you and the job you do? Does that intimidate you at all? Are you all frightened? Of us. Because some of the journalists have been actually uh, uh, charged and, 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 I mean, by others who say that we're going to get you. Mm -hmm. They've Everyone. been threatened. Well, it doesn't, it doesn't frighten me. It angers me. It frustrates me because I got into this business because I wanted to delve into uh, subject matters that, you know, maybe a lot of people don't understand and to tell the truth. It was always about the truth. Mm. And we all came along at a time when journalists said something, people believed it. Mm. If we did a story, even a consumer story about something that was dangerous, you know, uh, people believed it. Mm. And the idea now that people think that they can sort of pick and choose whether we are telling the truth and whether this reporter is telling the truth or that one is not on another channel, it really frustrates me. But I feel more than anything else, it just, it's a challenge that we've got to step up to. I hate the term, um, but I think that we, it, it puts more pressure on us to just get at the truth and to really, for our integrity, to speak louder than ever. Well, let Deborah, me say this. Think? If it's fake, it's not news, <laughs> period. Mm. End of report. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's out there. So how do we as journalists um, come up with a plan to fix it? Um, I think 
what we all can do right now is as we're telling our stories or writing our reports, what we need to be sure to do is include the source material mm -hmm. in the body of the story. Remember when you did those term papers and you had to footnote everything and say where you got the information? We now must include the footnotes in our stories. Yeah, the but other... what about those who are sources who don't want to be identified. How do you deal with that? Um, well, you have to find a way to share who that is. Now, the BuzzFeed thing is a whole other thing, right? Let's don't go there. We're not going to go there. <laughs> but for, here's a very easy example from Inside Edition. Look, we're not World News Tonight, so it's a different kind of story. But we had a piece on the other day about a cop that had shot a nine-pound chihuahua, he said, in self-defense. you got to wonder. <laughs> um, and we had the video. And of course, we didn't show the dog getting shot. It turns out that every day in America, 25 dogs are killed by law enforcement, which means roughly 10,000 dogs a year are shot by cops. Wow. Who knew? Um, that statistic comes from the U.S. Department of Justice. So when I said that in the show, I said, according to the Justice Department, because people don't believe the statistic. Mm. Oh, it's the Justice Department. I guess it's legit. That's what we have to start doing as a beginning to changing this 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 boat of an attitude that we have to correct out there. Now, you're, you're in advertising, and, but at the same time, the New York Times has been under a heck of a lot of pressure, yes. not least because of the uh, op-ed page yes. piece that this member of the administration who still, or members, Anonymous. we don't know, mm -hmm. who shall remain nameless. Yeah. Those pers that person or those persons have never been uh, introduced or, or revealed. Right. So how do you deal with that? Well, so at the Times, this was a really interesting moment for us because um, we have only three people it, in the organization uh, who actually know who Anonymous is. And when Sarah Huckabee, St Sarah Huckabee Stander, uh, Sanders uh, put our phone numbers, she tweeted out our phone numbers at the New York Times, the switchboards couldn't handle it, so they started sending all of the people calling in millions. I mean, we had so many calls for days, and they were coming to the advertising salespeople, they were coming to our operations people, they were coming to the newsroom, they were just spreading them across the company. And were they frightening? Some of them were, some of them were not. Some of them were, you know, they were divided, just like our country, right? They were very 50-50, you know, please deliver this to our great President Trump. Um, you know, that you have to give them the name of this person, and then others were, you know, fully supportive of the editorial position. The, it was scary for our employees. We had threats. We had some deemed credible. The FBI was in our offices. Um, it was uh, really not a, a positive moment. But what I will say is that there are positive things that have come out of the whole fake news debacle. And fake news is real. It is real. It is out there. We will continue to have to address it. However, you mean the phrase, not the real fake news. I mean, I mean, there is, there are, there are deliberate operators out there that are, yes, that are, that are to providing, yes, yes, yes. Sure. Yeah. misinformation. But that's not in news. Order to benefit right. them. That's propaganda. Right. Propaganda. So, so, so we have to fight it. But what I will tell you is that it has helped our readers and I think people around the world start to get more sophisticated about understanding not only where their news is coming mm -hmm. from, mm. but the difference between opinion and news, mm. right? So we have an organization at the New York Times, and a lot of people didn't realize this until two years ago, um, or a year ago when this happened, I guess. You have the newsroom, which is all about unbiased original reporting. And then you have the editorial team, right. and that's the opinion pages. And that is clearly separated. They don't even report to each other, nor work in the same um, you know, capacity. They're, they're kept very separate for a purpose. Mm -hmm. Consumers are starting to understand that. And I think there has been a side benefit. There is not only have we seen in our business a flight to quality, given the, um, I think, proliferation of this fake news problem, we've also seen that, um, you know, consumers are supporting us more. They're coming to the organization. Our, not only our audiences are growing and our paying subscribers are growing, but the engagement around our content has never been higher. And Edelman just came out today with their trust barometer, whereas for the last couple of years, I don't know if anybody saw this, but for the last couple of years, the trust in the news has been was declining. 17, I think, was the big year. 18 was really trying to figure out you know, who they could trust. The, the results of this study came back today and said that trust in traditional news sources is up by 14 points. Oh, so, that's great. That's, that's fantastic.
Yeah. Um, I would ask a question about polls, but I'm not going to. <laughs> I will just very briefly, because I want to go to some of the people in the audience in a moment, but I, how, are you, how are you facing the whole issue of enemy of the people? I think, are you threatened at all, ever? I have a bit of a different take on it. I agree with the vast majority of what everybody said here. I think that it's very important right now for news journalists to have an incredibly thick skin. Sorry? Uh, to have a very thick skin as a journalist. Uh, I see some tremendous journalists covering the White House uh, who do that, and then you see some who become very... Uh, activist with what they're doing to an extent and when I was in Grady and I was going through news source I mean one of the core principles that we were taught is you don't let your biases get into what's happening no matter what is happening yeah. and since I've been in the business it's always been a go-to for politicians to bash the media when they don't have anything else to say we're just seeing that like exponential mm -hmm. right now so mm -hmm. when I was sitting talking to David Muir yesterday we were just talking about how important it is to present the facts of every story, all sides, not necessarily the opinions, but the facts of the story and let people decide. And when you do that, I think that you're going to stay away from some of that criticism. And just adding on top of that, when you do a story, especially if you're going to have sources and anonymous sources, you better be a thousand percent correct that that is going to be factually accurate. Because right now the bar is so high right. and all you're doing is if those stories are not correct mm -hmm. afterwards, then you're just teeing yeah. up the people yeah. who want to bash the media. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I was saying to someone earlier that I'm so impressed with the New York Times because when I do read it on my computer, I also read, we made a mistake on X, Y, and Z, and we're changing it. And, and so I think that helps to protect against the charge that you're being biased. I want to go to the audience, but I have one more quick question before I uh, do that. And um, I want some brief answers, if you don't mind, because I know that we want to hear from some people in the audience. You, you talked about the, the Times having reach all over the world. Mm -hmm. But one of the concerns that a lot of people have these days is the fact that a lot of local news organizations, newspapers, are going out of business. Yeah. Now, you may be able to reach people in China or the, you know, Africa or wherever, but what about people in Covington, Georgia? I don't know if their paper has gone out of business, but mm -hmm. in some of these local communities where their daily newspaper is drying up, what, what, what's going to happen? It's scary. I mean, I think we look at the biggest question that I think we are faced with right now is who's going to fund the journalism? Because the advertising model has changed. Mm -hmm. So is it going to be benefactors, especially in local news organizations? Because a big, huge, international, global news organization like the New York Times will make enough money through subscriptions and through advertising and through other means to survive. But local news organizations will not survive without real support. Some of that could come from readers. Some of it could come from from um, you know, benefactors, but if you look at even Gannett and the, the hedge fund yeah. thing that's going on there, scary. I think we have, it's scary. I mean, I think we have to understand who's gonna fund the journalism of the future in those local organizations because it is paramount. Local journalism is critical. Yeah, but you also have to be concerned about who's funding and what their particular preferences totally, are yeah. political and otherwise. Okay, totally. so we're going to go uh, into the audience. We have a very special uh, guest, and I want to bring him into the conversation. Please welcome my friend and co-conspirator sometimes, <laughs> Dr. Jeffrey Jones, who's executive director of the great Peabody Awards. Dr. Jones, you have a question for our panel? I do. Um, Thank you all for doing this. This is fantastic. And uh, in many ways, uh, the television news and the modern presidency have grown up together. And both are structured by a set of norms, and I don't think I'm saying anything overtly political to say we have a political administration that is thwarting all norms of how politics has been conducted. And so the question really for you is, as an institution of journalism, how do you respond or what types of conversations are you having about the challenges uh, to the shifting norms of the presidency? That can be how the White House uh, press is conducted or how foreign policy is conducted via Twitter. How do journalists respond to the changing norms of the political arena? How does the profession respond? And in fact, who has changed those norms? 
that's just a follow-up. I hope you don't. I said we were co-conspirators, right? So who wants to take that on? I'll start, and you all feel free to jump in. I think for us here at ABC News, I mean, obviously we're all aware that things have changed drastically, and social media has created a, a you know, a, a big uh, a, a barrier in some ways to um, getting the the truth and getting um, our messages out there. I mean, even though social media is everywhere, it makes it harder because people are getting little snippets. Uh, all over the place and may not always be accurate. I think for us, the conversation here at ABC News is always about balance. And we've always had those conversations, but I think more than ever before. Because I think right now we're living in a time where everyone seems to be predisposed to think that there's bias, that, you know, this particular newspaper is more liberal, this particular television station is more conservative. Um, they've got people working there who seem to reflect that view. So I think the conversations that we have here is about balance and kind of almost reaching over backwards to make sure that whether it is a tweet, whether it's Instagram, whether it is uh, just a regular story on World News or 2020, that we are representing all of those viewpoints, including some that may be kind of extreme on both sides, so that you can be seen as um, a very, um, I guess, non-biased organization. I think more than ever, that's the conversation that we're having. But I think to follow up on that, I think in, in the decision-making process, we have to be very careful that we are not being used as a pawn um, in someone else's agenda. Mm. And I think we certainly saw it during the political campaign for uh, you know, 2016, um, then candidate Trump was incredibly effective of taking the oxygen out of the room mm. with these um, rallies that were held in a way and things were said that we'd never seen in the political um, arena before. Um, we see it now with tweets and posts from not only the president, but people in the administration. Um, yes, it's news because there are officials who are saying these things, but I think it's very, very important that as the decision is made, do we broadcast this? Do we print this? Um, is there a motive? Um, are we unwittingly playing a role for an agenda? Um, that's not our appropriate role to do. Well, let me ask you this as a follow-up to what you both have said. Um, are, are journalists today being too submissive uh, to the tweeting people? I won't say, <laughs> I, won't, I won't get political, but are you all being used? I, I'll piggyback on what Deborah's talking about. This is something that I talk about with a lot of our interns and younger journalists. And it's, I think that you really have to uh, fine-tune your critical thinking skills because we have seen with politicians right now, and not just one, a lot of politicians, some are better than others, but what they'll do is they will hold red meat out over here and we see large parts of the media on the local and the national level run in this direction when something else is happening over mm. here. Mm -hmm. And our news cycle right now is so rapid and so fast that within five hours, I mean, a story can be boring and nobody's talking about it anymore. But it's really important to think about why these stories are developing, why people are saying certain things, and what else is rippling below the surface at the same time. Because I think right now it's very easy to jump on every single story or every single tweet that happens when there's a lot of other things that are going on at the same time that could be a byproduct of what's happening in the moment. Mm. Hasn't the 24-hour news cycle, though, changed a lot of that dynamic? I mean, it once was a time when you get news <laughs> at 6 o'clock or 7 o'clock, and then you go to bed or look right. at, you know, yeah. George and Gracie or whoever you were looking at. That tells how old <laughs> I am, too. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, but, I mean, it, it was... it, the 24-hour the news cycle is made for the tweeters, is in my view. So if, if I could add on to that, because I came from cable news to ABC News, news and I have a firm belief that our society right now many people in my family uh, had become a society that seeks affirmation instead of information mm -hmm. so if you want to affirm what your belief set is you go to the source uh, where they're gonna say here's what we believe and it resonates with you instead of spreading out uh, to watch various networks or to read the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal to get a bunch of different sides of a story and then form your own opinions. So I think that is a hardship right now in the news business. Uh, cable news certainly contributes to that. Uh, and my advice to everybody, especially younger people, is to get your news from a variety of different sources, then form your opinion sure. as to what is going and, on. That, that's Frank very Brady. important. Now, now, 
excuse me, go ahead. And let's make this one brief because okay. I've got one I'm dying to ask. Okay. I was just going to say that Frank Bruni has a piece in the New York Times uh, in, on, in editorial pages on this exact topic mm -hmm. and about mm -hmm. what the media's responsibility is mm -hmm. in there. So I encourage everybody to read that. I was also going to give a quick anecdote about the tweeting mm -hmm. thing. So on the first tweet that Donald Trump tweeted at the New York Times, it was 6 o'clock in the morning on a Sunday. And um, the you know everybody started calling everybody on the leadership team, and uh, you know our editor Dean Baquet and Mark Thompson our CEO and AG our AG Salzberger our publisher, and they tried to figure out what are we going to do had, along with our head of corp comms what are we going to do do we tweet back <laughs> <You know? laughs> and ultimately the decision it? after that first six o'clock on a Sunday morning that for, you know the response to the first tweet we did tweet back and we tweeted back actually. The failing New York Times, you know, here are our results. We're not failing. It's, we're doing great facts. And mm -hmm. so I think now 200 plus tweets in, we've learned some of them are worth tweeting back at and some of them are not. But there's a larger question here that we all have to grapple with. And that is, how much are we going to let distraction yes, and, yes, you know, those kind of moments that he, he and others like to kind of throw the ball over there so we don't look over mm -hmm. here, how much of that are we going to take control back mm -hmm. around in the right. news Agreed. business? Yes. Agreed. Thing, one of the things I love about this panel, in, spite, in addition to you all being so incredibly talented and informed is diverse and we're getting a lot of criticism or I'm reading a lot of criticism from places like Richard Prince's journalism columns mm -hmm. that the uh, diversity and inclusion is suffering at this point that uh, there are fewer and fewer minorities fewer and fewer women on the other hand we're seeing something different we're seeing more women so where do you all see in your own professions and your own organizations uh, diversity and inclusion? I think it's something that we're still struggling with here at ABC and probably all the networks uh, are still struggling with. On the one hand, you can look on air and you can see a lot of diverse faces so you might be led to think that wow it's incredibly diverse but when I'm sitting in conference rooms and we're talking about stories editorial um, content most of the people surrounding me are either white men or mostly people not of color mm -hmm. um, do you have the same thing about that uh, yes every now and again <laughs> I might say something about that or just pipe in about you know my opinion and mm -hmm. just sort of calling attention I mean I wouldn't say regularly I do but it is something that I noticed and I remember particularly getting ready for some big assignment once and I just was looking around the room and it just sort of occurred to me like wow yeah. I can't believe I'm the only woman of color in here mm -hmm. and here it is you know at that point 2018 so it is something that I'm aware of I take it seriously in my journalism and I think sometimes I take a certain amount of pride when I'm out reporting because I know I am representing. But it's a little frustrating because we don't see the people who are making the big decisions <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, as in a diverse way as much as we probably should. Of course, oh, the I New York Times just... is headed, of course, by an African-American. Yes, Dean Baquet, our editorial director um, and an LSU fan, I might add. So we, have, <laughs> we have a little back and forth on, yes. our, on our Georgia <laughs> LSU, yeah. Um, but I will say that the New York Times has done a couple things. Two, the most important thing we did was two years ago Ago, we released our numbers um, of employees who are uh, minorities and we list our entire um, panel of, of employees who's diverse, who's African-American, who's Hispanic and the numbers were terrible mm -hmm. and I think the idea there was we're, we've got to start somewhere and we're going to start with transparency and this is going to be our benchmark moving forward mm -hmm. and so we're releasing it publicly every year the numbers at the New York Times of the employees who are people of color who are Hispanic who are how we're making a difference how we're how we're changing that picture that was the first thing we did and I was really proud of of AG and Arthur the Salzburgers who made that decision because it's risky yeah. that's the first thing the other thing that we've done is we've started to um, in addition to our gender editor who's keeping everybody honest and making sure that we're representing uh, correctly we started something called black at New York Times and um, it's 150 people plus and it's a really powerful group of people who uh, are who are interested in change and who are interested in helping people at all levels uh, have a have a bigger voice at the times mm -hmm. we also have our, a women's network we really are working from the inside out I think to try to change it it's not there yet we have a ton of work to do but isn't it also the case that some of the language has to change because when you talk about minorities 
you're not talking about just black people or brown people anymore. You're talking about a group that's of people who are about to become the majority mm -hmm. in this country. And are they going to be, how are they going to be, are they starting to be represented? Well, how do we enfranchise them? In addition to being the host of Inside Edition, I'm also on the board of directors for the Viacom Corporation. And one of the things that that we take very, very seriously at Viacom is that everyone who works within our organization um, needs to feel valued and needs to be supported in whatever their professional goals and their life goals are. And we have ERGs, employee resource groups, um, any way you slice it. You know, if you if if it's a, a gender thing, if it's a trans thing, if it's a Hispanic thing, you know, whatever whatever way you self-identify, there is a place within our organization, separate and apart from whatever team you're on as a, an employee, where you will find people of, of common purpose. Right. And, and we find that very, very helpful on all levels. Right. I, 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 excuse me, I, I, I'm getting so much something say, in my so ear that says say. we're almost out of time. But we, I wanna, we have some great students in here. What are you saying, 10 minutes? We got 10 minutes? Okay, so where is Sarah Hammond? Sarah, where are you? I wanna hear your question. Uh, if, let's hear your question. Can you put it a little closer? Um, Y'all kind of already touched on this, but if you are going to use anonymous sources, how do you go about establishing that trust between the journalist and the consumer? Hmm. How do you establish the trust? I, I think that you have to sort of establish that with anybody, whether it's anonymous or not. Uh, as a journalist, uh, I always walk into any room, any interview situation, um, you know, to try to connect with a person. So um, whether it's going to be anonymous or not, I think it's all about trust and, and your reputation as a journalist. I would like to think that my reputation and the work that I've done sort of precedes me a little bit. But uh, in terms of anonymous sources, I don't, I don't really know about the rest of you, but I think it's really more about uh, you and your integrity. Okay, I think if you don't the fewer have a anonymous position. sources, the better, honestly. I think right. the, the fewer anonymous sources. I mean, right. certainly things like your editorial, but I think, you know, people, it's like a card they play. Can we go off the record? Well, actually, no. <laughs> Let's keep this on the record. And I think as journalists, we have to sort of stand up to that and say, no, I'd like to keep this on the record. And it goes back to the critical thinking skills because somebody's telling you something doesn't mean that it's actually factually accurate. They could have their own agenda with what they're doing. We have a two source rule. So you have to have at least two sources and that's a bare minimum. And I agree with Deborah. I think that should be, you know, the last uh, case scenario mm -hmm. when you're going on with anonymous sources and you better know those sources really well. And if they burn you, you better be ready to put their names out there because it's your reputation that's on the line with that story, especially in our current climate. And, and also, I think it, means, it, it also has to do with the confidence that your editors have in you because often, when you don't have sources that want to come forward, you have to work them. Right. Yeah. So they yeah. have to, you, you have to be given time yeah. to develop those sources to the extent that they trust you. All right, I, I, I want to find Sydney Shadricks. Where's oh, Sydney? Okay. Earlier, you all were talking about everything that is expected of newer multi multimedia journalists. You're expected to wear so many different hats and be proficient in so many different skills. What do you think is the most important skill a multimedia journalist can have? Hmm. Wow. I think communication. Uh, you could have the best story, you could have the best information on that story, and if you can't convey it, especially these days, in a way that's going to hold people's attention, then you're going to lose people and your story is going to get lost. It's going to get uh, dust covered on it. So you have to be able to communicate, especially in broadcasting. I mean, one of the biggest challenges when we were a news source is everybody wants to write like you're writing for newspapers when you're writing for conversations. So you have to kind of unwind all the education that you had growing up in high school and your first part of college and make it much more of a communicative type uh, dialogue that you're gonna have. And typically, less is more with those things. So if you're boring yourself when you're writing a script or you're thinking about what you're gonna say out loud or you don't understand it, your audience is definitely going to be bored or they're not gonna understand it. So you have to be compelled to be excited about what you're saying in order to have people be excited when they're watching. I know you're trying to D wrap this up, but I would, well, I wouldn't disagree, but I would say compassion. Because you've got to get the person in the tent to begin with. Before you can even communicate the story, you've got to get the story. And for me, I think just showing compassion, because many times I'm interviewing people that I may not necessarily agree with. Or it could be somebody who's a criminal. Uh, but you, you have to show compassion to be able to convey a story. I can think. I say something real quick? And this is on the MMJ thing. I really think that one of the most important uh, categories is organization. 
you have to be organized, you have to be direct, you have to be succinct, you have to do it fast. And if you can't cut through the crap and get to the point of the story, you're not gonna be a very good MMJ. So be organized, know your stuff. All right, now, uh, we have some other students in here who have questions and maybe we'll get to them at some point, but I think we're running out of time now and I would be fired from life if I did not <laughs> call on the great Grady Dean, Charles Davis, who's Yay. sitting here smiling. You have a ringer? What's your question? Yeah, well, first of all, a couple of words, Charlene. First of all, thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you for being such a conscience to our students. Thank you for being such a guiding light to all of us. Um, and, and my friend, and, and I appreciate you so That's much. That's the most important, being Indeed. your friend. <laughs> Indeed, and thank you to Deborah and Deborah and Lisa and Will and Amy, wherever you are, uh, for your participation as well. This conversation and the privilege that we're all enjoying today of, of having access to this wonderful studio uh, was made possible because of the green lights and the strong sense of support from Barbara Fadida and ABC News and of course, our very own Robin Hommel, uh, without which this would not be possible. My question to the panel is this. Um, what is your wish or hope for our students? If you could see Grady College do one thing um, that maybe it's already doing better or something it's not doing that you would see us do, how can we better serve our students? That's a great question. I, I would say dig, 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 work, work, work. I think we're in a, a period right now where things are available so quickly. You know, social media, they can look up something really fast. Wikipedia, don't rely on that. Rely on actual old fashioned research to try to find out what you need to find out. I have one. I, I've said this to you before, Dean Davis, but um, the, the university surprised me when I thought I would leave the campus of the University of Georgia and start my career and it would be uh, you know, part of my past, but you, you guys in the journalism school have stayed with me my entire career. And it was so beneficial for me. And I continue to appreciate everything that you guys have done for me beyond my education, beyond setting me off on this adventure. So stay with the students. Students, stay with your professors that inspired you because it will help carry you through your career. And I hope that I can also help the university in any way and will continue to do anything I can. But it's that ongoing relationship throughout your career. I'm still friends with two of my professors, and my sisters, I think, don't believe me because they're not friends with any of their college professors. <laughs> I mean, Steve Smith and Michael Cassinger, I still talk to uh, quite often. Um, I think that when you're talking to kids, because I run into this a lot when we have interns or people reach out to me from Georgia and I help them over the years, um, sometimes they're told, like, here's the path to do things. And what I've realized in this business is there is no clear blueprint at all. Everybody who is very successful at the network level has gotten to that level uh, in a different direction. The one core value that they have, I believe, when, when you sit down and you talk to them, is that they have passion for what they're doing. So that's the most important thing. I mean, as you kids are starting to think about what you want to do, my advice to you is figure out what you're passionate about and then figure out how to do that professionally. That may be journalism, that may be something else. But if you do that right now, you will have a rewarding life moving forward and then instead of feeling like you're spinning your wheels doing something that you don't really enjoy because you were told here's exactly how you should do it and here's how you're going to be happy 10 years down the line. All right. I, can, I, can I just respond yeah, real quickly? Yeah, I mean, the last getting one. the... Um, what I would say, Dean Davis, is keep doing what you're doing. I'm here today because the Grady School forced me to get an internship. Continue that mm -hmm. emphasis on practical experience. And mm -hmm. kids, there are a million different places that you can get that experience. And to the point of making meaningful connections, not only have you and I and Parker Middleton mm -hmm. sitting right next to you had a meaningful connection, but I am delighted to say that one of my professors is right over here in the yellow sweater. Hazinski has been a part of my life since he stepped foot on the University of Georgia campus and continues to be and is a source of, of all kinds of good things. So those meaningful con ah, connections make all the difference. So Haz, thanks so much. So our deepest thanks to the University of Georgia's Grady College of Journalism and Mass Communication, along with Dean Charles Davis, Parker Middleton, and Dodie Cantrell Bickley and the students of Di Gamma Kappa who helped produce this event. And thank you again 
to our Grady greats for your insight, your experience, your empathy, your compassion, as I have learned to say about something good in the 17 years I worked in South Africa. For each and every one of you, long live. Oh, love long, it. Live, long, long live, Grady. Long live. Goodbye. <laughs>